Welcome to Chapter 6, Consumer Purchasing Strategies and Wise Buying of Motor Vehicles. Now, if I were going to name this chapter, I would name it, I'd like some more things, please. It's the American way. My apologies beforehand, because in this chapter, I thought, come on, this we got to make this stuff come alive. And so I have a tendency to be a little over the top. And as I said previously, insult everybody. So, so please realize that it was meant to be taken in all good fun, especially those of you who are dog lovers and, um, and, and like large motor vehicles. Hmm. Okay, let's get started with a quote from Microsoft Chairman Bill Gates, who at the time was the world's most richest man, most ri world's richest man. At, at times he's not. Uh, for a while there, it was Mexican Carlos Slim, and then uh, Warren Buffett. So, But this was the time he was the world's richest man. And he said to CNBC, he wished he were not the world's richest man. There is nothing good that comes out of that. And you're thinking, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'd like to find out. Wouldn't you like to find out? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Mr. Gates in the 1990s was so focused on destroying everybody else in the world and taking over the world that he failed to realize how rich he was. And they, uh, one reporter asked him, well, what are you going to do with all your money? Miss? Who are you going to give it to? And he said, I'm not giving away any of my money. And there, <laughs> he didn't understand how wealthy he was. He doesn't understand that he, he, if he tried, he couldn't spend all his money. If he goes to shopping malls and stuff, he just couldn't do it. And so uh, there was a bit of an uproar. And they said, Bill, you don't understand. You, you're going to be giving your way. I am? Yeah, you're too rich. You can't. I, oh, I, I will? Okay, okay, fine. All right. So they, they came out with, Mr. Mr. Gates misspoke. He meant uh, that currently at this time, and then he you know, was apprised of how rich he was. And now he is giving it away uh, over decades. Yes. To good causes, by the way. Good causes, by the way. Slide number two. Culture of consumption. So we have dozens and dozens of culture of consumptions. We'll start with number six. I don't know why. Why not close? Let's close. Slide number three. Thanking you for the close of your dead people. Okay, a journalist was on assignment covering cultures around the world and specifically how their cultures relate to and think of our culture here in the United States. His guide in East Africa, the affluent part of Central Africa, invited him to see the distribution of the clothes from the dead Americans to the locals. When the journalist asked the guide why the locals thought the clothes were from dead Americans, the guide looked at him oddly and said, why would a living person give away any of their clothes? You see, it didn't, <laughs> it didn't even enter their consciousness that somebody would give away clothes that fit them and they were still alive and you, you give away your clothes? Oh my goodness, you must be very, very wealthy. Slide number four. Scandal number 12. Pets. How much does a very busy dog therapist charge for six one-hour sessions with you and your dog? Is it $250, $500, $1,000, or $1,500? And in the face-to-face -face class, we have the ABCD cards that people hold up at San Diego State. You just press a little button and a number shows up on the screen above you. But anyway, this dog therapist is charging... $1,500 for six sessions. That's 250 bucks per hour. I'm in the wrong business. When I see how this, I mean, how, I shouldn't use that word, how, how much people pamper their pets, especially dogs, I think of Vietnam where they eat dogs. We live across, I told you I'd insult everybody by the end of the semester. We live across the street from a park and people bring their dogs there and it is nauseating to listen to people how they, oh, come here, Pookie, come on, girl, good little girl. And then Pookie t proceeds to rip the throat out of some other dog. Bad Pookie, don't do that. Don't rip the throat out of that doggy there over there. 
People get nuts. They get ridiculous over their animals. And they spend a lot of money. How much is Fido costing you? Hmm. Speaking of dogs, what is the average yearly cost of owning a dog? One dog. Less than 500 between 500 and 1,000, between 1,000 and 1,500, or over 1,500 hours? Well, of course, it's over 1,500 hours. One series of therapy sessions cost um, um, $1,500, right? So it's got to be more than that. It's about 1,800 bucks. And the total for Americans is uh, $58 billion and rising quickly. And, of course, you no doubt have seen lots of doggy daycare places and and uh, uh, spas for dogs and people driving around just washing dogs. Oof, oof. And cats are a little bit better. They're cheaper, not as much time, but people don't like them as much because they don't love you as much as a dog loves you. Okay, enough. I told you I would insult everybody. My apologies. Slide number seven. Frugal, frugal, frugal. I can't get my wife to spend any money. Don't forget taxes. For every $2 you spend, you must earn more than $3, maybe up to $4, depending on your income bracket. And this is from The Wealthy Barber, where he said a dollar saved is $2 earned. It says, it's a... Um, a takeoff on a penny saved is a penny earned, uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin saying. But this quote is from The Millionaire Next Door, another very good bo book that you should read eventually. Now, be careful because this book spawned a entire series, The Millionaire Mind, How to Think Like a Millionaire, uh, how to, you know, whatever. Just, just, there are so many of them. But the, the, the first one was The Millionaire Next Door. And... In this book, he talks about how most of the millionaires in America are self-made. They are not, as many would think, people who have inherited their money. And he talks about a millionaire who is complaining about he can't get his wife to spend any money. How did the wife of a millionaire respond when her husband gave her $8 million worth of stock in the company he recently took public? She said, I appreciate this. I really do. Then she smiled, never changing her position at the kitchen table, where she continued to cut out 25 and 50 cent off food coupons from the week's supply of newspapers, just as she had done each week for the past 27 years. Dear students, someone has just dropped $8 million in your lap, and you continue to cut out coupons from the week's newspaper? Do you think this gentleman could have made his company into what he did if it weren't for her frugality? Frugality used to be a virtue. And then along the line, somewhere, our culture of consumption turned it into a vice. Oh, he's cheap. He's, oh, don't stay away from him. He doesn't spend freely. And then get up in the next morning and go to work to earn the money that he spent that he hasn't earned yet. Slide number eight. Speaking of millionaires, again, this is from the wealthy barber. These people cannot be millionaires. They don't look like millionaires. They don't dress like millionaires. They don't eat like millionaires. They don't act like millionaires. They don't even have millionaire names. Where are the millionaires who look like millionaires? Now, this was spoken by a senior vice president of a trust department of a major bank that had commissioned a focus group interview of 20 first generation millionaires. They had purchased fine wine and caviar and little tea sandwiches. And all the vice presidents in charge of very important things had three-piece suits and Fuji shoes. I'm sorry, Gucci shoes and Armani. They call them Armani suits, but I don't understand why they're Armani suits. They're their money suits. After you buy, it's not your money anymore. It's their money. So they shouldn't call them our money. They should call them their money. Anyway, what did the millionaires show up in? They showed up in jeans and t-shirts, and they they asked they didn't want to drink the, the the fine wine. They wanted beer and and ham sandwiches, and a few of them like scotch. 
Did you think the senior vice presidents were millionaires? No, 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 no. <laughs> They're not millionaires. They make a great salary. They spend freely on fine wine and cars and clothes, but they're not the millionaires. Hmm. Slide number nine. There are over 8 million households in America with a net worth of over $1 million. The median age is 57 years old. So it doesn't happen overnight, folks. It takes time. And what does median mean? Median means 50% above, 50% below. Most are married and have not divorced. What's the most important financial decision you will make in your life? And more than 80% are first-generation millionaires. So the media wants you to believe that these people all inherited their money. And the truth is, no. They earned it. The median income, again, 50% above, 50% below, is $131,000 per year. Is that a huge salary? No, it's not, it's not bad, folks. Don't get me. You know, I'm not trying to badmouth it, but it's not what you think millionaires earn. Because remember, 50% of them make less than this. Most invest at least 15% of their income each year. Uh-huh. What were we shooting for? Indeed, if I could get you to 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 invest, you know, 10%, I'm a happy man. These people invest 15, 20, 25% of their income. And 50%, again median, have never spent more than $399 on an hour, their money suit, $140 on a pair of Gucci Fucci shoes, or $235 on a bogus wristwatch that they don't even look anymore. They don't even look at the wristwatch anymore. Now they look at their cell phones. But they got to have that droll, bold, gold, whatever it's called, Rolex for $5,000. <laughs> Slide number 10. The lesson is clear. If you want to become a millionaire, having a high income is not important. You must be frugal and invest wisely. Therein lies the paradox. You understand what a paradox is? Two pieces of information that don't seem to mesh, but when you think about it, it does. Do you want to be a millionaire or do you want to live like a millionaire you think lives? You know, all the people you think are millionaires, fancy cars, flashy clothes, are really just high income, high consumption wage earners with 10 credit cards run up to the maximum. The millionaires are the penny pinchers. Is bizarre, and that's why it's called the millionaire next door. There are people you run into every day at school, at the post office, in the supermarket, who are millionaires, and they look like just regular old individuals. But they are frugal, they invest wisely, they play good defense as opposed to good offense and that's only if you sports fans if you like if you like a sports analogy you could think of offense as how much money you can make your income but the defense is how much you spend how much you invest who you marry slide number 11 oh yeah piano but what about the lifestyles of the rich and promiscuous huh and don king and jennifer spears and Brittany lopez and who's that new one who who, who she was, you know, it's Siley Myris or something like that. Uh, she was so, it was so cold outside that she, that she uh, was clinging to that wrecking ball with clothes on. Yeah, yeah. What about them, huh? The media loves to showcase the high net worth, high consumption celebrity figures. The truth is they constitute only a small percentage of the millionaires in the United States. Well, why does the media love to advert? Does love to 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 uh, encourage people to 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 follow these media favorite stars, celebrities, because they encourage us, the little folk, to overconsume. Does Paris Marriott, Par Sheridan, Par Paris Hilton, does she? Buy the water that she carries around while she's flashing her, her genitals and her boobs. No, they pay her a million dollars to, to carry that water around. Does Leopard Woods or Cheetah Woods? Tiger Woods. Che Tiger Woods. Does he pay for the Nikes they, 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 they want him to wear? No, they pay him $90 million to wear those things. Because if Cheetah Woods or if Paris Marriott 
I don't even understand. Why are people so excited about these women who go around crashing cars? The car crashians. I do not understand why people care about these people. I just do not understand. Slide number 12. And when you're sitting at, at home watching TV, feeling sorry for yourself, as you compare yourself to Donald Bump or Rump or whatever his name is, instead compare yourself to the citizens of Niger. I think it's, I've heard people say it who are very smart. Everybody else says Niger. Not Nigeria, no, Niger. Over 60% of the population live on less than a dollar per day, folks. You go to five bucks on Monday, you've just spent the entire week's salary on one cup of coffee. About 41% do not have access to clean water. Over 90% of the women over the age of 15 are illiterate. Ladies, and life expectancy at birth is approximately 41 years old. In fact, about 1.2 billion people around the world, about one in six, survive on less than a dollar a day. Now, am I telling you this to make you feel bad? No, I'm telling you this because you should be ecstatic. You're rich, rich, rich. You give away your clothes. You feed not only yourself and your family, but you feed a dog or two or three. And there are people who are living on a dollar a day. And yet, the media has convinced us that unless we buy the brand new iPod 27 and a half S that just came out, that you didn't even know existed, but now that you've seen it, you know you can't live without it, you are somehow incredibly poor. Uh-huh. When we get to investments, I'm going to tell you that this is a phenomenal opportunity. M millions of people, hundreds of millions of people around the world are coming out of poverty and are having their standards of living risen to the point where they can afford clean water and good food and clothes and shelter and mobile phones and internet access and bicycles and car. So, so wait till we get to investment. So I'm actually pretty optimistic about the future, providing we don't blow ourselves up. But in the meantime, we want to be happy, right? And the media is telling you you're not happy unless you spend yourself into oblivion. Slide number 13. Do you still believe that you would live happily ever after if you were a millionaire? Hmm? Well, not necessarily. Write this down. It's a formula and it works. Happiness is equal to what you have, your possessions, over divided by what you want. Indeed. You see, here in the West, we try to maximize the numerator. We try to go out and buy as many things, please, that we can have. The problem with that, dear students, is they'll never, you'll never, you'll never satisfy all your wants. Your wants will grow far faster than your needs. In the Eastern religions and the Eastern philosophies, what they do is they try to work on the denominator. They try to minimize how much they want. Because then what you have makes you feel more happy. We in the West tend to um, equate heaven in the Judeo-Christian uh, religion world with nirvana in the Eastern religions. And the truth is they are diametrically opposed. Heaven is a fulfillment of all desires. Everybody gets a harp and wings and there's choir practice and there's a birthday party every every uh, day and you get to play volleyball and shuffleboard and singing and yeah. In the Eastern religions, nirvana is the destruction of all desires. You no longer want all these worldly possessions. You finally don't even want your life. You're not attached to the world anymore. You didn't think you would be discussing this stuff in a financial planning class, did you? Simply put, let's read at the bottom. If you never learn to be happy with what you have, 
right now, dear students, assuming you have food, clothing, and shelter, and of course, internet access, and you're not being tortured and your health is in decent shape, you will never be happy. If you're not happy now, your wants will always outweigh what you have. And even if you do become a millionaire someday and you follow the precepts and the concepts in this class and you're young enough and you probably will become a millionaire, you will still face the same day-to-day -day travails that everyone faces. Your life will be more comfortable, but there is no guarantee of happiness. Uh-huh. Slide number 14. Scandal number 23. Batteries. Batteries. Well, in the face-to-face -face class, I showed the students a alkaline battery the typical one that's advertised on the news i mean on the, on the media and then a nickel metal hydride battery and actually they're being replaced by lithium which is even better but given normal usage how many alkaline batteries would be replaced by one nickel metal hydride re rechargeable battery and the truth is folks it's about 500 but if you treat the battery correctly and that is use it down and then bring it back up again use it down um bring it down you can get about 750 alkaline batteries do you understand why they advertise the energizer you know, exactly the, but lithium is going to take over and it's even better we'll see when the uh the folks in uh, uh the, te the tesla tesla's building the uh, gigafactory then so we'll see what happens there slide number 16 beware of emotions Sh shopping can be an addiction many people buy things simply trying to fulfill some unmet childhood desire and there's a gentleman by the name of john bradshaw who wrote some very popular books where he had he coalesced much of the uh, the work that the psychologists and the psychiatrists had done over the last you know several decades and he describes an addiction as any mood altering behavior that the participant is no longer in full control of and that's it's a very uh, uh smart um description because what what is happening folks in these situations is that the person does not feel well for whatever reason and so they go through this mood altering behavior to lift themselves out of that depression or out of that bad mood and he talks about shopping as one of those behaviors and a, and a client who had 47 cashmere sweaters she would go through she wasn't feeling well so she would go through the process of identifying and purchasing and bringing home and uh, how much is a cashmere sweater folks you know a couple hundred dollars there's her retirement in the cashmere sweaters and don't think the advertisers do not know all about this and other psychological phenomenon with everybody with the big smiles on their faces look at slide number 17 do you ever wonder why advertisers use sex to sell their products hmm guys here is the brain of the typical uh oh censor that uh oh yeesh, yeesh, yeesh. come on guys admit it right uh, it drives me absolutely wall a wall because it works and i'm looking straight at the ad you can keep the beer but i will take the bubble-headed bleach blonde with the big you know type thank you very much it gets me so angry and something else also uh slide number 18 does advertising really work well if you ask people do television commercials affect them what they will say is oh no television commercials do not affect me and that's why the advertisers spend hundreds of billion dollars a year because they know it doesn't affect you let's read together I economists estimate that this was 2005 I think that every hour of TV a person watches in each week increases their annual spending by about two hundred dollars in 2005 Nielsen media research reported the average person watched approximately four and a half hours of TV a day or 31 and a half hours a week at two hundred dollars in extra spending for each hour watch that means the average person spends an extra sixty three hundred dollars a year in two thousand and five that they would not have spent if they didn't watch TV and that number has risen now over to five hours per day people are watching over five hours a day which is nine years of your life now I don't know about you but I don't watch any zero so somebody else is watching 10 hours a day and here are a couple of links for you 
I told you I would insult everybody. I gotta tell you, folks. I can. I. I can. I can just. It's several people when they find out we don't have a television in the house. They just go, but you don't know what you're missing. And I ask him, have you ever read Huckleberry Finn? I said, oh, I don't remember. Have you ever, did you actually read The Lord of the Rings? Other than watching the movies and The Hobbit, did you, and you watched the movies, of course, but did you actually read it? Well, you don't know what you're missing. Okay? <laughs> if you haven't read, you see, I just turn it around on them. They say, you don't know what you're missing. I say, I know exactly what I'm missing. I'm missing 10,000 images per day flying at me from out of that idiot box. And here, there are there's plenty of research out there, folks. But there's some research that says it takes every hour you watch takes 22 minutes off your life. Um, unhappy people watch television. Happy people socialize and read. People who watch network news, television news, are more ang- anxious. Just if you are so inclined, just take a look at what that television is doing to you. Plus, it's costing you over six thousand dollars a year. Uh huh. You didn't even know it existed until five minutes ago, but now you have to have it. Slide number nineteen. What factors motivate you? Well, these are all from the book, and I have highlighted the ones I think are the most important: the culture, the ads, the media group. Why do they want you to walk around with a with a uh, t-shirt or a or a baseball cap that says Arrow Postali? I don't even know how you say it. Or a Hollister. When I thought that, I thought when I first thought Hollister, I said. Is there a school by Hollister Street down in the South Bay? No, no, no. Uh-huh. That's right. They know that if your peers are wearing a t-shirt that says California in a funny way, that you're going to want to do it because you're going to want to be different just like everybody else. I want to be different just like everybody else. Slide number 20. Speaking of influences, would someone please tell me why a roach handbag is worth $600 more than a J.C. Penney's handbag? You you know those roach hand... Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Coach. Coach. Yeah, well... I don't understand. Why do they call it coach? For the prices they are asking, shouldn't they really call them first class? I mean, coach? And don't even get me started on lousy Vuitton or loser Vuitton. Um, yeah. Um, I did my research. I said to my wife, Anita, because that's her name, uh, take me to Fascist Valley. Okay, take me to Fascist Valley. So we went to Fascist Valley, and we went in the Roach, a coach store, and I went up to the woman and said, show me your most expensive bag. And her eyes lit up. You know, thinking I was going to buy it. And she kept apologizing because they have three thousand and four thousand dollar bags, but she didn't have any in stock. So she shows me this bag. It was thirteen hundred and fifty dollars. And she's telling me about all the wonderful things about the bag. And I'm thinking, okay, where are you? Where are you hiding the cocaine? Where are you hiding the gold? It's a bag. You put things in it. It's a bag. And I can't figure out why anybody would spend three one thousand three hundred fifty dollars for this bag. And I said, well, wait a minute. You know, which ones do you sell the most of? Excuse me, which ones? Do, and she brings me over this little bag. It's, you know, it's about eight inches long and five inches tall and a little bit wide. And uh, and she goes, this is the one we sell the most of. It was like 90-some dollars. Like, it wasn't, wasn't 99. I forget what it was. And I thought, okay, this that's, I understand. The person is not feeling well. They want to reward themselves. They want to mood alter they want to alter their mood so they go out and buy for a hundred bucks another roach handbag or a lousy Vuitton or whatever we went to this one place called Hermes or Hermé or maybe oh my lord this stuff was so expensive and people think nothing of buying it how much does it cost after tax do the calculation slide 21 scandal number 73 light bulbs light bulbs yeah Given normal usage, and of course we would have an incandescent bulb and a fluorescent bulb, and they're being replaced uh, in the all face-to-face class, how many incandescent bulbs would, re- re- would be replaced by one fluorescent bulb? Well, I'll give you a hint. Fluorescent bulbs are sometimes called cold fluorescent. You know, cold, cold. Why? Because they incandescent bulbs, the old bulbs, give off 90% of their energy as heat. And you can grab a fluorescent bulb while it's on and you won't get burnt. But don't do it because you could get shocked, okay? But they, 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 they last 11 times longer. Plus, they use 
one quarter to one fifth of the energy. So over its lifetime, how much money will one fluorescent bulb save you in energy costs at current electricity rates? It's about 45 bucks. And the fluorescent bulbs are being replaced now by LEDs, which we don't even know how long these things will last. That's how long live they are. You'll probably break the bulb before it burns out. And this is an example of the current situation in our politics. The manufacturers and the governments got together and said, look, we got to phase these things out. And the manufacturers were very happy to do it. They were saying, yeah, these are ridiculous. we got to get rid of these things. They've been around since the 1880s or something like that. The technology is long past its lifetime. And they, they announced that by such and such a date, they weren't going to be producing incandescent bulbs. Or if they were, they were just going to be very few. And if, what happened? You got it, people. Damn, damn, the government, tell me what kind of bulb I can buy. Oh, boy, oh, boy, people are goofballs. In the name of freedom, we should use up whatever resources we have so that you can... Slide number 24. Consumer purchasing activities. I told you I was going to insult everybody by the end of the semester. I hope I'm not going too fast, but I try to go through this quickly because it's, it, it, there are so many scandals in, of consum consumerism in our culture. Slide number 24. Consumer purchasing activities. Problem identification. Yes, we need to identify the, uh, the items that we will fix our, our situation, whatever we need. Do you take the time to shop? Do you check out uh, personal contacts, the experiences of others, business organizations? People will invariably say, yeah, yeah, sometimes, but not always. It depends. Are quality and price always related? Mm, not necessarily. I have still unconvinced why a roach handbag is worth $600 more than a JC Penney's handbag. Slide number 25. Here are some um, tips. The book says that negotiation may be used on some products. I say all products. Everything is negotiable. People say, you can't, can't go into JC Penney's or Target and negotiate. Sure you can. It don't, be reasonable. If you're going to buy a f entire uh, back-to-school outfit it fits for six of your kids. I'm sure they're going to give you a discount. A 2004 to 2007 survey by Consumer Reports shows that more than 90% of shoppers who asked for discounts got at least one. What's the worst thing I'm going to do? They're going to say no. That's the worst thing I'm going to do. Oh, he said no. Big deal. Negotiated price cuts were, were on a wide range of goods and services, including furniture, electronics, and medical bills. Yeah, especially if you pay cash to your doctor. They will lower the... Uh, that was my experience. Drop 20%. With no question. Don't have to deal with insurance companies? No problem. Give me the cash today? Fabulous. Decide on cash or credit, the book says. I say decide on cash or cash. Get all acquisition and installation costs and conditions in writing. Maintenance and ownership costs may be associated with some purchases. Wait till we get the cars. Complain if you're not satisfied with the purchase. Do you complain if you're not satisfied? Well, the I know it might not sound correct, but the stores do want you to come back and complain if you're not satisfied. Again, be reasonable. What drives me nuts is when people use something for four or five years and then take it back to some of these stores that have these, you know, 100% guarantee, we'll take anything back. Because then it ruins it for the rest of us. Because then eventually they say, this is ridiculous. I mean, this person got their, their money's worth out of this and they destroyed it and we're not going to... But so, so be reasonable. Because they know that many people will not complain. Now, pity the poor person behind the complaint desk. But they don't want you to go to their competitors. They want you to come back. So they're going to want to make it right. Be reasonable. Slide 26. Timing purchases. Well, I like to think of this... One, when is the best time to buy Christmas cards? Right, the day after Christmas. Just think that. Always keep that in mind. When are you buying something? When, when, it, when it's, you don't need it anymore. That's the best time to buy. Brand comparison versus impulse buying. Because door, door store brands can be low-cost alternatives. Many of them are made by the same company. Shh. 
If you're Costco and you go to Del Monte, I don't know if they do, but let's say they do. They go to Del Monte and say, will you make us, um, you know, a million cases of, of uh, Costco. It's called Kirkland, right? Ketchup. And Del Monte says, no problem. <laughs> Same stuff. Evaluate warranties and service contracts. Price comparison. Unit pricing is supposed to provide a standard of measurement. Sometimes they make things a little hard to understand. And I'm sitting there with my cat car. My wife says, well, how much is this? How much is this? Do you use coupons? Do you use rebates? Why do they like rebates? Why don't they just give me the money right now? Because they know a lot of people won't send the darn thing in. More convenience and ready-to-use products mean higher prices. Hang on a minute. We'll get to that. There's a wonderful example from a now-defunct magazine called the Tightwad Gazette, which we'll take a look at. <clears throat> Sale does not always mean saving money. In fact, slide number 27. Here's a... I, I, just, I just loved it. I'm, I can... It was as if it were it was it was like eight nine years ago, but uh, but uh, but I just think of it as if it were today. But it's on sale. Think of how much we will save every day. They hit you with this: buy more and save more. The more you buy, the more you save. Wrong. You may spend less, but you will never save money whenever you buy something, folks. Ne you only spend money whenever you buy. Saving is when you go put it in the bank or an investment. Repeat after me. Now, I want to hear you. Come on. Spending is never saving. Spending is never saving. Spending is never saving. Look at this, folks. Look at this. This woman gives me this receipt, and it says, You saved $37.02. We didn't save nothing. We spent 75 bucks. We, bucks. we bought two pairs of shoes, my wife and I, and I went up to the woman and I said, Look, if this says I saved seventy thirty seven dollars and two cents. I didn't save anything. I spent seventy five dollars, and my wife said, "Oh, please, Frank, leave the poor woman alone." <laughs> yeah, the Mervins are gone, and the woman said, "Oh no, sir, uh, you saved thirty seven dollars off of the list price." I said, "Well, I never buy list price. Nobody buys list price. Ten list price is ten percent off list price." My wife, my wife is pulling me away. <laughs> poor woman. Yeah, right. Um, slide number twenty nine. Meat, meat. Scandal 118. Yeah, uh, how many gallons of fresh water are used to produce one pound of beef? How many gallons of fresh water? Is it 100, 500, 1,000, or 25? Wait a minute. Those cows must drink a lot of water. No, nothing to do with how much they drink. It's how much grain has to be grown and fed to the cow to make one pound of beef. And the problem with this number is that there are huge, uh, there's a huge range of estimates. The estimates range from 441 gallons of water per pound, and of course that's from the beef industry, to over 12,000 by this academic who's widely respected from Cornell University, but most people think he's over the hill, over, over the, not over the hill, he's probably over the hill, he's older, but uh, over the top. Most reasonable estimates are about 2,500 gallons of fresh water to produce one pound of beef. So how many people can be fed via the grains it took to, to grow that animal to the point where it was taken to the slaughterhouse with the resources needed to feed one person with beef? Is it 5, 10, 20, or 30? It's 30 people. So, so you go to Hodaz, which you should do, every, you know, not too often, folks. You don't want your cholesterol to go too high. But you go to some really great burger place. You eat one burger. You could have fed 30 people with the grains that it took to, to make that burger. Now, am I trying to turn you into a vegetarian? No, no, no. Some people are better off. I tell people I feel better when I don't meet, when I don't eat meat. But I feel great when I'm eating meat. You know, if I don't eat meat, I feel better. But when I'm eating meat, I feel great. But what we're finding out now is that meat in general is not the best thing for your health. You see, we started out as vegetarians you know, millions of years ago and then became omnivores because it made sense for us to do. But that's when we didn't live that long. Now that we're living a lot longer, we're finding out that meat is not the best for a long-lived life. And, 
You don't have to agree with me, folks. That's why there's chocolate and vanilla and some people like strawberry. But the less meat you eat, the more healthier in general you're going to be over the long term. These are these are diseases that take you know decades to to um, uh, show themselves. But one of the uh, very interesting and tragic things about the Vietnam War was they had all these young bodies that they got to cut up, and many of the young men had. In beginning and intermediate stages of arteriosclerosis because of their diets. So if you're the kind of person who's got to have meat two or three times a day, you really need to educate yourself about, you know, what's going on inside that body of yours. And other people get away with it. You know, they, what, what's Warren Buffett, one of the world's richest men, has a diet that would, you know, I know I wouldn't be, <laughs> I know I'd have, at least I'd be at the doctor's taking whatever those things are for cholesterol. And some people's bodies are just really good at uh, dealing with it. So he's in his 80s and he still drinks cherry Cokes and eats burgers and Dairy Queen every day. Slide number 32. Here's the slide I was talking about. The cost of convenience. You go to the store and you find a 10-pound bag of potatoes for $1.99. And you can do that every once in a while. Uh, depending on where you go. Sometimes, some people told me if you go to the dollar store, sometimes they have 10 pounds or 5 pounds for 99 cents. But that's 6 cents for a 5-ounce potato. And a 5-ounce potato is a, you know, about as big as your fist, depending on how big you are. A little bit bigger than a deck of cards. A medium-sized potato. Now, what can you do with that potato? Throw it in a microwave, mash it, turn it into french fries, whatever. Well, as soon as you go and buy it processed in the Orida Steak Fries 28-ounce bag, now it's 73 cents. A factor of 10. Why do you think they advertise this stuff so much? If you buy Pringles potato chips in the 6.38-ounce tube... Now, now, those things aren't potato chips. I don't know what they are, but they're not potato chips and a why would you put food in a tube? Looks like it should be tennis balls. But anyway, it's two dollars and nine cents. The hungry jack all rotten, I mean all rotten potatoes in the six point one ounce bag, two dollars and twenty two cents. And here's something you can't even buy anymore. They finally took it off the the market. Thank goodness. Well, some people are really angry because they like these things. But Lay's fat free Olestra potato chips in the six and one half ounce bag. The last price I found was $3.12 for 5 ounces. Now, what is Olestra? It is this, they also call it Olean or Olean, I'm not sure. It was developed by Procter & Gamble, and it is a fat substitute. It is not fat. It is a chemical that tastes like fat, but is inert in your body. Well, it's not quite inert, <laughs> but it, does, it you don't absorb it into your bloodstream. But what it does do to some, not everybody is it, it was so they took it off they took it up but originally when it came out on the bag folks it said warning may cause vomiting and loose stools and abdominal cramping and vitamin uh, deficiencies and and um diarrhea and anal leakage Oh, that was on the bag, folks. That was on the bag. And still people were so upset when they took it off the market. Because here's something that you're eating that's not good for you, folks. But it tastes like fat. <sighs> McDonald's in the two-ounce serving, $4.03. Do you understand why they say, do you want fries with that? Where does McDonald's make its most money from? French fries. Not from the burgers, not from the Coca-Cola. They make most of their money worldwide from asking you if you'd like fries with that. $4 for a 5-ounce potato. And then this stuff, this, I, I, when I first saw it on the shelf, I just thought, you can't be serious. You can't not be serious, folks. This is a cup, a loaded cup of mashed potatoes. And it just, I don't know what you think when, I, when you see this stuff, but I just, uh and it's six dollars and seven seven cents for a one and a half ounce cup. But the absolute geniuses out there, folks, are pop chips. Geniuses, folks. They sell you a bag of air. 
0.8 ounces for 99 cents, and then I saw it for $1.19. That turns that 5-ounce potato into $7.44. What is the cost of convenience, folks? Yeah, it is very high. So think about that now. Anything you buy, any processed foods, you can assume you're spending at least a factor of 10 more than if you cooked it yourself. And this is your assignment. You're going to do this slide. Now, I don't care if you use potatoes. If you do, go get your own information or use um, um, wheat or rice or oatmeal or beans. The staples are easy to use. It's a lot harder to use dairy products, but although you can do it. You, you can use uh, veggies and fruits. It's harder to use meat. It's just not as hard. It's easier if you use rice. Corn is really important in our, our diets. Uh, wheat, oatmeal, beans, those are the sugar. Sugar is actually pretty easy to use because it's in, it's in everything. And what you're going to do is you're going to find those products where that staple is the largest ingredient. And then watch what happens as you uh, buy it more and more processed. The price skyrockets. So that's your assignment. Check out the assignment sheet. And there's a bonus assignment there about television. I forgot to tell you about when we were on the slide on TV. Slide 33. Speaking of food, <laughs> don't get hungry. I'm getting hungry when I do this lecture. Um, uh, match the continent with the number of calories per day. I think you can figure it out, right? Indeed. We eat an average of 3,600 calories per day, a lot more than we should. The Europeans and your Asians, about 3,200 calories per day. And then the Africans, 2,400 calories per day. The average is about 2,700, which is about right. Depending on how active you are, men need a little bit more than women. Um, the total, total slide 34, the total daily caloric intake of the average American has risen by 148 calories each since each day since 1980. And this amount reflects an average, an extra 15 pounds per person each year. Are your clothes feeling a little tighter recently? Yeah, mine are too, especially because I haven't been exercising as much because I have a little bit of accident with my foot and my I fell, I fell, something fell on my foot, so I've been not exercising as much, and boy, is my clothes feeling a little tighter. Slide number 35. Speaking of food, okay, what are we looking at here? 8,000 years ago, this was the image of the ideal woman. What a babe. We bowed down to her in, in 8,000, 10,000 years ago. Why? Because look at how healthy she is, right? She can have babies and feed them. There's plenty of food to be had. And you know where I'm going with this, don't you? Yeah, today, this is the image of the ideal woman. This is scary, folks. And yet these women get paid big bucks to look like that. They, they eat the four major food groups, coffee, lettuce, water, and nicotine. And, and, and those are the, f Ugh. what can't these women do that this woman could? These women can't have babies. Not in that state. Once a woman's body fat gets below about 5% or so, she stops menstruating. Her body realizes that she can't have a baby bizarre right <laughs> that's what we've created in an era of scarcity we would uh, uh deify we would glorize um we would um you know bow down to uh somebody who was large and very healthy and very and very Ob and she's obese, actually. You know, this is not safe. Uh, and in, this, in an era of uh, of uh, where there's so much food that we don't know what to do with it, uh, we glorify people who are dying. <laughs> the don't think the uh, the authorities know all about this, folks. 
But for us to actually eat the amount of food we're supposed to eat, that would mean $150 billion less of food products sold in the United States every year. So there's an entire industry out there that is rooting for us to get larger and larger and larger. Slide 36. According to recent studies sponsored by the United States Department of Agriculture and the National Resources Defense Council, how much of the nation's food ready to harvest never gets eaten? You won't believe me, but it's 40%. 40%. Not just the stuff you throw away, folks, but the stuff that doesn't even make it off of the fields. We have food that is rotting in the fields because we don't have enough people to pick it. And we produce more than we can possibly consume and throw it in the ocean, let it rot in the fields. And how much does the average family of four throw out every year? Now, there are lots of different studies. And the one that was the most conservative said about 600 bucks. That's $50 a month of food we just throw away. $50 a month put into your Roth IRA. Slide number 38, bottled waters. Culture of consumption, 235 bottled water. You know, folks, I just, again, I just think, okay, it's, it's your money. If you want to spend it on a bottle of water, go right ahead. But don't think it's anything special. In the face-to-face -face class, I show this one bottle from Voss, it's called. And it's $7 for an 8-ounce bottle. And the, the bigger one is $11. What do they do? Hand-pick the hydrogen and oxygen atoms and gingerly put them together? This link takes you to a uh, article about a company that was using tap water and just you know filtering it and turning it in a in a uh, a bottle and selling it and they sued <laughs> to, to have them say look this is just tap water folks um if you don't like san diego water and who does it's very hard meaning there's lots of minerals in it and it doesn't taste that good get a filter Get a filter. It'll be a whole lot cheaper than going out and buying water in bottles. Trust me. Slide number 40. The problem, though, is it's not really just water. How many plastic water bottles make their way into landfills or wind up as litter each year? And the number is 22.6 billion, although the state of, the New York, state of New York says it's actually closer to 28 billion. And here's a link that will take you to a website that shows a counter. And it shows you how many, well, this is not just uh, water bottles, but also cans and bottles of other stuff is just showing up in the landfill every year. And this counter just flies. And you can put it on your own website if you want. <sighs> Slide number 41. Steps in resolving consumer complaints. Do you return to the place of purchase? Do you contact the main office? I love writing a letter to the CEO of the company and complaining. You know, the CEO doesn't read it. Somebody else does. But it's worked for me in the past. Not always, but usually. Consumer agencies, such as the Federal Trade Commission, they have, uh, and the Better Business Bureau, I don't think they're that great a group, but they do have methodologies for you to, to resolve issues with manufacturers and sales organizations. But two of the best ways are through mediation and arbitration. Mediation is a process that is uh, non-binding. You don't have to do it. You know, whatever you come up with, you don't have to do it. There's nothing, nothing going to no. There's no legal um, uh, stick or carrot. It's it's all uh, self-done. But it's very cool. And the mediators have a process for you to go through so that you can work things out with the other party. And it's very successful. It's, it's, been, it's been shown to be very successful because they don't only deal with the monetary and the possessions. They also deal with the emotions. They also deal with the, with the, uh, with the uh, you know, he did this to me. Okay, well, let's talk about that. The arbitration is very different. Arbitration is binding. And what you're doing is you're basically signing away your rights to go to a, a judge. And you're saying, I will abide, and the other party says, I will abide 
by what this third party arbitrator uh, comes up with. And that's what these shows on television, these judge shows, are. they're not really uh, courts, they're arbitration panels. And you can have more than one person. Sometimes you choose somebody, they, the other side chooses somebody, and then the two of them choose a third party, so there's a, you know, there'll be a, not, there won't be a tie. It's a lot cheaper. And if you do this and then try to go to the judge, the judge will say, look, you, you, you said you wanted to go through arbitration. Unless there was, there was some hanky panky that went on and, and then, then they could, you could eventually get your day in court. But the last place is to take legal action. And my advice, folks, unless, even still, just stay away from the courts, folks. You think you're going to get justice, but you don't know, especially in small claims. It's cheap, folks. You can't use a lawyer. You don't even want to use a lawyer. You just have your day. But if you don't look, I mean, say you look like the judge's ex-spouse. Oh, well, you've lost. And what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to um, take you to send you to mediation first. And the judge will say, look, here's we have mediators. The, the small claims courts have mediators. And, and they often, they're very, very successful in what they do. But stay away from them. The only people who win in court, folks, are lawyers. Because that's the way it's set up. Try mediation or arbitration first. But if you're so inclined, maybe you want to go to Legal Aid Society, maybe you want to take a look at these prepaid legal services, there's a wonderful website called NOLO that we will come back to when we uh, get to the end of the semester. That has some really good help, really good help. But um, go to mediation. Slide number 43. To protect yourself as a consumer, deal with reputable companies. Avoid doing any business with or giving any information to telemarketers or spammers. There's a great website called do not call .gov. It's not perfect. There's still people who don't even bother. They know that you don't want to be called, but they'll call you anyway, and they'll do their best not to say who they are because the fine is $11,000 if you're on this do not call list. Avoid signing contracts and other documents you do not understand. Compare financing through the seller with other sources such as credit unions. Yay, credit unions. Avoid rushing to get a good deal. If they tell you, oh, it's only today, fine. Tomorrow, it'll be, it'll be only tomorrow, yeah. And be cautious about offerings that seem too good to be true. Why? Because they usually are. None of my students, right? Nobody's going to be flim-flammed by these people. Yes, yes, yes. And finally, dear students, we are here on slide 44, where we look and see... The scandal number one of our culture of consumption, and that is cars. So that's where we'll take up on our next presentation. And I do hope that you enjoyed our little um, uh, flight of fancy where we uh, threw things around, helter skelter at time, helter skelter at time, and and saw that there are many places for us to rethink our culture and improve our financial well-being. See you in our next presentation when we discuss car.